area in, in Norway. And as we know, most of us, gas and oil is also where the Norwegian money comes from. So it's a quite crucial area for, for industry. And thinking back, um, uh, I recollect more and more um, meetings. As, as much as I remember being uh, on the mountains and living the traditional life, I also remember all the, the meetings that I, I followed my father to in, in Hammerfest city, because there were meetings with uh, uh, the municipality, with uh, people that were going to build new stuff, with the police, because uh, they were pressing charges. Uh, for our reindeers uh, interrupting the city life and shitting there <laughs> and those kind of things and and um, yeah so I think that's kind of where it started I am I'm going in the end because the video is still kind of working um, to finish up um, it's a slow internet line okay but um, what I'm um, now dealing with is um, eyes then what are we doing uh, with our you know disruption industrial um, destruction of the world to potentially say the underworld people so that's what my book is about so I make this uh, it's not in the same style as the, the um, introduction but it's, it's a very modern uh, <laughs> story where where these kids um, the meat was gone and the blood and uh, the hair, everything, you just saw the, <laughs> the bullet holes in the middle of the forehead and it really became a very strong image uh, for me as well because this is definitely not our way of killing animals and it's not our tradition to toss away the whole head because this is um, the resources are scarce or uh, I don't know if that's the right word in an Arctic environment, so uh, especially you don't toss away, you know, the few things that really uh, survive uh, in this environment. So, for us, we would um, use this sort of an artist, an activist, you know, advocating something. Now, obviously, you had gone quite a good length because your family is involved in some a specific issue. But other than your family, were you working with other? Were you working with an organization, and, and, and how, how did you kind of get to this point where your art is really beyond, really beyond just artistic presentation? You are on a cause. Letting me sit here a whole day and listen to all these interesting talks, and now my head is not where it should be. I'm <laughs> thinking about what everyone else has been talking about. But I will do my best and um, try to to explain or give an introduction of my, my practice. Um, I, as Katya mentioned about the data and the, the term or notion of contemporary or modern art, um, I think I define myself more uh, of a storyteller uh, than any, anything else. I'm trained uh, as a journalist um, probably <laughs> because of uh, the same thing that John said, I care a lot. So it started with um, uh, just trying to get a voice in, in things that really matter. Um, how do I make this story complete? Well, <laughs> let's rewind a little bit. Uh, I come from a, a reindeer herding uh, family in Kautokeino, north of Norway. And uh, this is what I grew up with, uh, a traditional lifestyle. Um, and these are also, as we have been hearing in all presentations, there are um, so many similar, <coughs> how do you say? Um, Experience. Experiences, but uh, obstacles maybe. Uh, of being a colonized people uh, and still being colonized and land issues in particular is something that is very crucial I think for, for everyone especially for people who are dependent on land such as we are so uh, after a while um, 
the land issue is really intensified um, uh, the loss of land and uh, it was really difficult to, to put words on things and, and working as a journalist you kind of had to pretend to be objective <laughs> not have, a, have an opinion uh, but it just came to a point where it was basically just uh, silly so uh, I'm going to show you maybe a, a map to see uh, where it started where I decided to, to kind of give up the journalism this is um, uh, a map that I saw in 2012, I think, uh, and this is from the uh, Norwegian Geological Institute um, after a big uh, stately project called Nordområde Satsning. Uh, it's like the strategies for the northern uh, regions in our country. And um, all these dots mark uh, mineral findings. And the thing is, after spending over 10 years on this project and investing over 100 million Norwegian kroners, uh, this is actually what the whole project meant. But uh, during all this time, it was more presented as um, a growth project for the northern areas to, to get better conditions for people and the society in these little remote areas. So this kind of scared the shit out of me and probably a lot of other people um, when it really came out on the table what, what is behind uh, these money uh, and strategies. Um, so now we can move on a is little that, bit. Is that a chemical symbol, AU? Uh, we can look up later, okay. yeah. <laughs> but I think so, I think uh, Gold, gold or yeah, silver. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Not sure, but we can check out later. <laughs> so, um, going a little bit back to my practice, um, as you can see, this uh, is from an exhibition I made or uh, that I exhibited the first time in 2013. It was a year or two years after I quit my job as a journalist. Um, and they are quite expressive and dramatic and and uh, I guess it's a way of dealing with the emotions. First of all, get out my own emotions and frustrations or whatever I have concerning um, the issues that I work with. Um, and this image is quite important, but categorized in the modern literature, um, I don't know, vocabulary. <laughs> it would be something like fantasy or fantastic literature. But what I do is um, I use uh, the Sami uh, traditional stories and uh, I kind of blend it with the current ongoing struggles and politics. And I think um, I could maybe read you just the the preface or the introduction of the book just to kind of give you a notion of the stories and then I can go back to to talking a little bit more about why these stories are so important and a treasure for not only us but for everyone. So, a very short introduction. <coughs> can it be true what they say? Our legends say that there are milings everywhere the unbaptized children of shame who were once hidden in the ground and abandoned to eternal suffering. They have suffered neglect, confusion, sorrow, desertion, fear and hunger until all they have left is anger and malice. Or malice, I'm not sure. They live in between worlds and are never seen or heard unless something disturbs them. The something can be you or me. It is entirely a matter of chance, but whoever it is, the miling will hunt them relentlessly to take revenge for its sufferings. Is it really so? They also say that we share the ground and the water with more beings than we know. It is said that the Ulda people, inhabitants of the underworld, wander among us, that they live and look just like us humans, that they tend herds of snow white and speckled reindeer, but are not seen except by the eyes of the chosen. Can this be true? 
to give you a very short summary of the book, um, these two main stories uh, that I use is about the Mylings, uh, the spirits of uh, children that once were abandoned uh, to die for different reasons. Could be, um, you know, physical disabilities, uh, or they could be born outside of marriage, a lot of things in, in, you know, in an old world and in a harsh environment uh, of living. But the other legend is the underworld people. Uh, and our legends say that uh, or it's not a legend, um, it's, um, it's more of a Sami cosmovision. Uh, it's uh, based on the notion that we share everything, all of our ground and, and water with uh, the underworld people. And as I told you in the introduction, we don't necessarily see them, but, but by learning these stories, our kids from, very young, uh, from a very young age are learned to think several steps ahead, you know, and, and consider and be responsible for a lot more than what you can see actually here and now. And growing up, I, I of course didn't reflect upon, you know, the depth of uh, and importance of traditional stories, not only our own, but all uh, traditional stories. Um, but as I kept working on these um, long sto modern <laughs> versions of the stories I had to think more and more like why are these stories sticking and, and especially working with these political big issues why do I cling on to children's <laughs> stories so the thing is uh, it's not children's stories it's um, it's it's in a way like the basic key for human survival um, and I believe that's the core of uh, many or all traditional stories because our stories uh, are being told for thousands and thousands of years to teach us something, something very uh, valuable. And it just happens maybe in that process that uh, our people become brilliant storytellers. <laughs> so um, while you are maybe not even aware of the fact that you're learning something or that something is being planted that is supposed to grow uh, while you grow and think more and more of these stories. Um, they also function as great entertainment. <laughs> but as, um, as the rest of the world, um, my community, um, it's, it's modernized. So we are watching television, you know, spending all of our times on digital media. So uh, the stories are being forgotten. And I think we, we can't really forget them because they, they have these uh, very important things still to tell uh, all humanity everywhere. Uh, and when I travel in schools to really like read and tell to, to children, I very often reference to a short version uh, Ulda story that I, my grandfather told me. This is actually from the Reisa uh, region. It's on the coast side of uh, North Norway. And it's very short. It's basically uh, this uh, old Sami woman, uh, because many Samis um, uh, are not reindeer herders as well. And it was very uh, common back in the days that you had uh, a combination of a small farm, maybe you had some reindeers with uh, the uh, reindeer Samis, and then you went fishing and picking berries and, and other things. So she had a small farm and some cows. And every morning when she came out to, to how do you say? Yeah. Yes, to the house. No, no, just entering the house. One of the, the cows was loose. So it didn't help whatever she did. It was constantly loose in the morning. So um, it wasn't until uh, one night when she was asleep that she had a visit from this other old lady who was basically pissed off saying that now you have to move that cow because it's pissing right on top of us was to get access to the land you know control uh, the indigenous population by eliminating what uh, what they lived off um, yeah if we if we have a lot of time um, yeah we can talk more but but um, 
this is kind of the reference story because um, this is actually, uh, in my opinion, what I feel in my heart and my bones and in every breath that I take, this is what's happening uh, back home. If we take a look at the map again, you know, they want, it's all about the land, they want the land, it's, it's not even a question about it. And, and they are twisting um, laws and, uh, you know, we have been talking about using the, the colonizers' tools and, you know, owning the factory, they gave us these tiny ship guns and, and kept, you know, developing their own. So the Sami parliament actually is for us nowadays, in my opinion, quite a, a dangerous trap because um, it gives the opportunity to launder whatever decisions the government decides just by um, consulting the Sami parliament. They don't have any obligation to listen to what the Sami parliament has to say, but as long as they have been consulted, it's been happening in dialogue with the Sami community and the Sami people. So it's, it's shit dangerous and my brother, he won twice and the verdicts were quite dramatic and quite serious. Um, the first verdict stated that the government is violating his property right that is uh, protected by international human rights. Uh,